Hello and welcome to our service today at Living Water Christian Outreach. My name is Pastor Dustin Bowden. I am so glad that you chose to join us today for worship. If this is your first time tuning in, we would like to give you a special welcome. You could be doing anything else right now. You could be watching any other videos, but you chose to be with us today. So thank you for that. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to speak into your life today. And it is my hope and prayer that this message would strengthen, edify, encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Here at Living Water, it's our mission to love God, love people, make disciples, and help grow people in godliness. We want to make every effort to make an impact throughout the world with the message of Christ, whether it be in person, here at church, virtually on your phone, tablet, or, or smart TV. It doesn't matter. We want to make the kingdom known. So it is our goal to grow the kingdom of God and to help you to become all that Jesus has created you for. As long as it is day, we must do the works of Him who sent us. We must be about our Father's business. So thank you again for joining in today. Be blessed and enjoy the service.
think that clock's wrong because nobody's here. Brian always wants me to tell people, hey, make an announcement. You know, we're going to do this, but half of them ain't here to hear the announcement, right? The clock has struck zero. Justin, you want to go ahead and go? You want to do it twice? Do it for this half, and then 10 minutes later, do it for the other half? <laughs> Good morning. Have you gotten up and greeted everybody this morning? Tell them they look nice. No, they're not even listening to me, are they? Hey, Beth, you and Mark are in charge to let everybody know that we're going to be in McCollumsburg Friday evening, playing at something around the courthouse. All right? It starts at 6 o'clock, not 6.30. Go to 6.30, you're going to be late, and the other group's going to be upset. The main attraction starts at 6 o'clock. We're playing afterwards. We're the, we're the get them out of their seats and go home band. You know, we're, we're the part at the end where they say, well, let's sit here and listen to a couple so we're not rude, and then we'll sneak out. <laughs> I don't mind being that guy. There's power. That's right. How about we get up? Let's sing a little bit. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you. so much more and knowing that all you have in store for me is good so good today is the day you have been and I will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have been and I will rejoice and be glad in it and I won't worry about you Trusting in what you say
Good morning. We're going to open up with a word from Psalm chapter 147, verses 1 through 8. Praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. How great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds and supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. All right. Amen indeed. We may not have a harp, but we have an awesome and anointed worship team. And as we enter into worship today, just like the song said, you know, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. All we're called to is put today in the hands of God. And as we look at this, we see that he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. So I don't know what your week's been like. I don't know what kind of heartache you've had, what you've experienced this week. But there's a God who loves you more than anything. He gave his son for you. And he took those stripes so that you could have healing and you could have health and life, life more abundant. So as we get ready to enter into worship today, sometimes it's easier said than done to put off the worries of this past week and the worries that are looking at us in the face coming up. But focus on God, press in and push in as we get into this time of worship. So if you would join me with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that we don't have to worry about today because you already have it in your hands, Lord. We just know that all we have to do and all that we are called to do is to fully put it into your hands because you love us enough that you've already gone before us. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that as the world comes in to try and, and crush us down and, and push us down and beat us down, Lord, you are there to lift us up each and every time. And Father, all we have to do is go to you and your word promises that when we are weary, we come to you and you will give us rest. So Father, as we are coming at the close of a week and getting ready for a new week, God, any type of worry, stress, anything that is just making us tired and, and wearing us down, Lord, we just put it into your hands right now. And we just pray that you would give us the desire and the heart to come to you and worship and adoration because God, you are worthy of it all. So Father, as we enter into this time, Lord, any distractions, we cast it out in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just pray right now that we would press in and push in, that we would enter into worship without abandon, Father. We thank you for your promise. We thank you for your word. And Lord, for those that aren't here with us today and those that are viewing online and for those that are here, Lord, let us feel your presence. Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit to come and dwell in this place. Lord, let it be your spirit that guides us in all that we say and all that we do. And Lord, we pray for your wisdom as we enter into this time. As we press in, we worship in, in music, but Lord, we also worship in word. So Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together corporately, Lord. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. What could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive and All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you When you called my name called my name
the old man knew Jesus when I met you what a day when you called my name
mountains and the sea. Your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing when your love came down. Of lightning 
songs of thunder. They're singing on the string dance. Glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Yeah. Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are.
our God, sing with me how great is our God, and oh, sing how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Name above our names, worthy of name above all names, worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great, oh my heart will sing.
is our God. Sing with me how great He is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Now you give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. I got a couple announcements I'm going to go over here. Before we dismiss the kids, I just want to cover them and then we'll dismiss the kids. Uh, in the back, there are still a few of these surveys for the ladies' ministry. Uh, the time is ticking. I'm soon going to take them away and I'm not going to have any more surveys available. I want you to all have a voice. So if you're interested in, in ladies' ministry and the future decisions of directioning, uh, then please take a survey, fill it out, and get it back to me. You can put it in the offering vase or you can give it to me or somebody else. You can leave it laying in your seat and I'll get it. But uh, please do that. Uh, men's conference. There's information packets in the back for men's conference in October 18th and 19th. I highly, highly recommend the men of this church being involved in going down to Camp Hill for a men's conference. Even if you just drive down for Saturday, sign up and let me know because i got to order you a ticket. But I'm telling you, if you invest in this, it'll change your life. I'm telling you, if, if men of God want to be leaders of worship in their home the way that the Bible says there are, then you need to do this because this will help you. So that's back there. Uh, Monday, August 12th, tomorrow, our time with the senior citizens. So please, if we could have some people right after the service, help gather some chairs. They need, where's the 12, right? They need 12 chairs over in the ministry center. Uh, please do that. Everybody's welcome to come and help with that. So this isn't just a certain group of people. It's everybody. Uh, this Wednesday, there's no evening services because of the Orbazonia Rock Hill Vesper service and parade. So there will not be any services here on Wednesday. This Friday, August 16th, our worship team has an outreach. They're going to be in McConnellsburg playing. The event starts at 6 p.m. Uh, worship team starts at 7.30 p.m. Come out and support the team. Come out and support because they're, they're going to be doing what they do here for us every week to hopefully a lot of unsaved people. Amen? Amen. 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 So come out and support them. Youth Car Wash, August 17th. Uh, next Sunday, Faith Night at the Curve. And I got to say, how many tickets, Bridget? Nine? Ten tickets available. One seat's by itself. Seven in a row and two in front of that row. So these, at this point, if you want to go and you don't have a ticket, come and find us. They're yours for free. Come and take them. And if nobody in the congregation wants them, I'm going to put them out to the public for free, out to, the, to Facebook. So we got tickets. Come and see me. See Cindy, see Bridget today if you want those tickets. Uh, Sunday, September 1st, we're going to start dinner and a movie again in the evening. Chosen's going to start back up. And so we're going to meet at 530, have a light dinner, and then we'll transition over to the sanctuary and we'll watch two episodes of season four, The Chosen. Uh, and I believe that's all that I have. So we're going to go ahead and dismiss the kids and the youth. If you're, if you're a youth, uh, grade 6 or age 12 and up, up to 18, you may go up with, with Justin. Next Sunday, I believe, is our move-up day where everything shifts and changes for the school year coming. So I uh, just want to encourage you, be here next Sunday. So praise God. As they're leaving and they're moving around and, and our kids, uh, how many of you are thankful for the kids that we have in the ministry here? Amen. It's such a blessing that, that when, the, when the kids leave, half the seats are empty. That is. I mean, because as Justin said a couple weeks ago, our children are the church of today. They're the church of today. So it is exciting to me. Now, on that same note, how many of you are excited because we have men and women who will stand up and say, I want to teach your kids? Ah, you got to give them a little bit of a more hand clap than that. I'm telling you what. It takes a special person to teach children's ministry and youth ministry. You, just not anybody can do it. And I am so thankful for the people who say, I'm going to give of myself, my time. I'm going to give and I'm going to pour into these kids because we get them for an hour. The world has them when they go back to school for, what, six, seven hours a day, five days a week? You know, we, we've, got to be, we've got to be really serious about what we're doing. So be praying for our teachers, be praying for our kids. Uh, we're gonna, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're going to go there in just a moment, but uh, we're going to pray here in a minute. Uh, we're going to pray for the service, but uh, 
Kelly Fraker's dad's going for an operation today to have some heart work done. So we're going to pray for them right now. We're going to pray for the Tim Donaldson family. Uh, they, he, he passed, and, and so we're going we're to pray for peace for their family. Uh, we're we're going to pray uh, uh, for, for any other needs that we have. But, but I just want to encourage you. Where's Sue? God is a God of answered prayers. Amen? Amen. Amen. She had a need come up this week, and it was a, it was a serious need. And, and, and we called on heaven, and God showed up. God showed up. He, see, he never, never, never not listens to his children when they cry out to him. And so, so we're going to hold these people before God this morning. We're going to pray for them, and we're going to be believing that right where they are, God's going to be moving, right in their situation. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning. Father, we thank you for this day, God. God, I thank you for the word that you have given us. God, I thank you for the message that you put in my heart for today, God. I pray today, Father, that I'm able to deliver the message with clarity, simplicity, and accuracy according to how the Holy Spirit wants it spoken. God, let me say nothing that you've not ordained me to say today, Father. And I pray that the Holy Spirit takes the message and goes beyond anything that I say. Father, I'm thankful, God, for your word. I'm thankful. For, for, for your blessing upon it. God, we hold up uh, the Tim's family today, the Donaldson family today, God. I pray for peace, Lord. The Bible says that you're close to the brokenhearted, that you comfort those with a crushed spirit, Lord. And, and Father, this is a, this is a very uh, troubling time for anybody to go through when they, when they lose somebody in their family, God. So I pray, God, that the overwhelming peace of the Lord Jesus Christ would come and keep this entire family. God, I pray, Father, for opportunities, God, for, the, for Jesus to to be ministered to everyone. God, this is a celebration because he was a believer and today he is in heaven. I'm so thankful for that, God. I am so thankful to know that today he walks through the gates of heaven and he is there with you today because the Bible says to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord and, and he was a believer. So God, I'm thankful for that. I pray for peace to be extended to that family. God, we hold uh, Bobby Hall before you and the, the entire family there, God. I pray, God, right now where they are for, for a mighty move of God in that hospital room, God. I pray that a, a, a hedge of protection be placed around him as they are doing what they have to do. I pray for a miraculous touch of the living God to come to his heart to touch him. I pray for a peace to blanket the entire family. In the name of Jesus, let faith arise. And God, we thank you because you are a miracle working God. What you've done yesterday, you'll do today. What you did back in the Bible days, you'll do today. You're a God that heals and a God that loves. You do not change. And I thank you, Father, that you have heard our request today. And Father, that you're quickly acting on their behalf. Father, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, amen. 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 Okay. Uh, today, we're going to continue in, in our series of becoming, and we're going to go right to the next beatitude. Uh, blessed are the pure. Blessed are the pure. And, and so, so we've been focusing on the Beatitudes. And, and with the understanding that these are given to us by Jesus. Jesus preached this in the greatest sermon ever preached. And this is the prelude to that sermon. And so, again, when anything Jesus says, you need to pay attention to. Anytime that Jesus, you see, I mean, I understand the entire Bible is written by the Holy Spirit. But when it's something that was spoken and written and read, pay extra attention to it. And he put a lot of emphasis on these Beatitudes. And I believe it's because these are what help shape us and to become like Jesus, to become like Christ. And so today we're going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to read down through them, and then I'm going to, we're going to stop at verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up. On the mountain where he sat down and his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And so it was A.W. Tozer that said, the pure in heart are those who are unspoiled by the world and who live in constant contact with God. Amen. That's the pure in heart. 
And on Wednesday nights, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, but, but two weeks ago, I asked a question, and I highlighted it this past Wednesday. If you miss out on the Wednesdays, you're missing out. I'm, I'm sorry, you just are. Uh, you're missing out, because these are the, the, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and we're seeing how it applies to us. But what I asked was, what are you known for? You individually, what are you known for? What would your family say about you? If you died today, what would be remembered about you? If you, I'm, I'm talking like right now, you, would, you don't exist anymore. What would they be talking about in five years about you? And, and I shared some stories. I got stories of when I was a, a not so good kid. And I got stories my mama don't even know about. Praise God that, that she loves me. Praise God that she has mercy and grace. But I got stories that would probably really upset my mama if she knew. But you know, I don't want to be known for those things. I don't, want to be, I don't want people to be talking about who I used to be. I want people to be talking about who I am in Christ. You know, and so I'm thinking about this. The pure in heart are those who are unspoiled by the world. I don't want to be known for being spoiled by the world. I want to be known for being unspoiled by the world. I want to be known for a person who lives in constant contact with God. Not on Sunday. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, to the degree that all I do is talk about God. The greatest thing anybody could ever say is you just never shut up talking about God. That would be the greatest compliment that anybody could ever tell me. That would be because, because then I know that my heart's pure. But what are you known for? Are you known for a pure heart? Is your heart pure? We're going to break this down in a minute, but I want to give you an illustration. Can you put that first picture up, Debbie? Doesn't that look pretty? Anybody ever see a stream that looks like that? I don't know if you've ever been around anything like this, but I have, and recently I was around a body of water that it was just so crystal clear. I mean, it was just so beautiful, so beautiful. So, so just imagine that you're standing on the edge of this, this, this body of water here, this crystal clear stream or lake or whatever it might be, and it's so pure you can see the bottom of it. Every rock, every fish, every ripple, everything that's in it, you can see it. It's like a mirror reflecting the surrounding uh, uh, mountains and valleys. Now I want you to imagine that same body of water, the next picture, Debbie, polluted. Now if you can't tell, that's, that's full of garbage. It's stagnant. How many of you would like to have a drink of that? How many of you would really, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just kind of a person. I go out and I go out into the woods. I do drink out of a stream. I'm not afraid to drink. People tell you not to do that. I do that. I, I grew up drinking out of the streams. I wouldn't even imagine drinking out of that thing. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's polluted. It's murky. You can't even see below the surface. What we, what we wanted to look at, we can't even see. What once reflected the sky and the surrounding nature is now is distorting. And it gives us this heavy weight of neglect and contamination. And so what's interesting about this is these pictures give a great compare and contrast to a pure heart and a polluted heart. That's what they give. I mean, I mean think about that. Jesus, on the, on, on the Sermon on the Mount, he boldly declares, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But you want to know what those pollutions are in our modern day? It's distractions of society. It's this, 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 this uh, media-saturated world that we live in. It, it's the moral boundaries that are blurred. That's what we're talking about there. That's what pollutes your heart. And as that becomes a picture, I'm going to ask you, which one would you rather be known? Would you rather be the pure heart that offers an inviting drink of water? Or would you like to be the polluted heart? Which, which do you want to be known for? And so, so sometimes people say, that's unobtainable. And let, let me start off by saying, some of my message today might sound legalistic, but I promise you it's not legalism that I'm preaching. It's not, because when you came to Jesus Christ, when you bowed your knee, if in fact you did truly surrender, you know you got a brand new pure heart that moment. Amen. It doesn't matter what you did. It didn't matter if you drove your car into the house when you were 12 years old. It didn't matter if you rolled your mother's brand new car almost a week or two after she got it. It didn't matter. Well, I'm not going to keep telling my stories, but listen. <laughs> the moment that I bowed my knee to Jesus and I truly surrendered, in that moment, my past was gone. Amen. I am brand new. I am pure. And it's the same for you. You are that body, not that body of water. You're the other body of water. 
immediately whenever you have surrendered your heart to Jesus. So we're not talking about legalism. It's not what I'm preaching, but, but because of Jesus, we can live in this purity. Do you realize that every single day you're going to have temptations? You're going to have problems, and it's going to try to lure you to have the pollution of the world in your heart. And you know what? You're probably going to miss it somewhere. You're probably going to make a mistake. I just made a mistake yesterday. I confessed to my brother here, and I had to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. I did something that wasn't very good. I'm very sorry. You know, guess what? I'm human. Uh-oh. Yeah. Don't forget that. I'm human. But I made a mistake. And, and you know, one of the things that I want to be known for is, is that when I do make a mistake, that people know that I'm humble enough to say I'm sorry. That's what I want to be known for. I want to, because Jesus was humble. Jesus was humble. I want to be known like, as, as Jesus was. But we're not just talking about an outward cleansing. It's an inward cleansing. You see, the world defines purity by you have to be perfect. I mean, I mean the world's definition of pure is, is no stains at all. And that's what purity is. But, but the purity that the Bible talks about is deeper than that. It's, it's purity within yourself. It's internal. And so we're going to look at purity today. And we're going to look at it. Before we get there, we've got to look at how we've gotten to this place. Because as I've told you each week, each of these beatitudes build upon the one previous. And the first three beatitudes were like roots. And they laid the foundation. And then, and then the next three that came, they're the fruit. Okay, they're the fruit. That's what comes out of it. So the first three, being poor in spirit, recognizing our spiritual poverty and that we have to be completely dependent. God, I can't do anything. Without you, I'm lost. Without you, I'm a terrible person. I recognize I'm going to hell. God, I'm sorry. I'm poor in spirit. That's the foundation for a pure heart. And then we move from pure, poor in spirit to mourning over our sin. Whether it's our sin or the sins of the world, God, I, I, I know that I'm broken, but, but it's causing me to repent. You know, this is where I'm not preaching legalism, but I'm telling you, a pure heart before God recognizes where its defilements are, removes them because I want to be right. You know, legalism says I have to be right. When you're pure in heart, you say, God, I want to be right. It's not, it's not I have to be right, it's a desire. And that's what leads us to the next one a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. You know, and so, so out of that, there's a meekness. There's this gentle strength where you come under submission. And then you go to a hunger and thirsting for righteousness. You're yearning for God's ways. And then we come to being merciful. And Justin did an absolutely wonderful job last week preaching about mercy. He did a fabulous job. He was, and when we first talked about it, I thought he would be a great person to preach on mercy. I just felt that. But, but he did. But how do we relate to others? How do we give mercy that we've received. And oftentimes, we are not quick to forgive people. Oftentimes, we want to receive something that we're not willing to give. But, you know, one time I was dealing with unforgiveness, and God said to me, this was, he might talk to you other ways, but he talked to me very strongly. And maybe I got a hard head and it needs to get through. But he says, how dare you withhold forgiveness? I forgave you. So there's nothing that anybody could ever do to you that you should not forgive them for. And I went, Wow. And he goes, even yet the worst sinner, while they were still sinning, I died for them. That's what I expect you to do. So it doesn't matter what they've done to you. It absolutely does not matter. Your obligation is only to love and forgive. That's it. Nothing else. But you want to know what happens when we hold on to unforgiveness? You see that beautiful picture? Now imagine that that's a reservoir. And it's trickling down the hill and it's feeding the, the, this town. As long as the water's pure they're going to be healthy, right? Now, now imagine that a, a, an animal, let's say a cow, or let's say an elk or something, goes in there and dies. Do you want to know what happens to that pure water? It contaminates it, and everybody downstream from that is going to suffer. They're going to be sick, and you can treat the water. You're going to be spending thousands upon thousands of dollars treating the water, but it's not going to do anything because people are still going to get sick and people are still going to die until you go to find the source of the contaminant and you pull it out. And you want to know what happens immediately? It begins to clear up. And so unforgiveness at times becomes this thing that holds up in our heart and it just poisons our entire body. You've got to learn to forgive. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, there's no forgiveness for you. Justin brought that out last week. I won't preach his message. I want to, but I won't. But a pure heart, what is it? It's undivided in its devotion to God, 
transforms every aspect of our lives, and it's leading us to see God clearly in a world that's clouded by distractions and sin. And so today, we're going to look at three key aspects. Number one, understanding a pure heart. Number two is going to be the challenge of purity or the challenge of a pure heart. And number three, the reward of a pure heart. So we're going to start with understanding a pure heart. What is a pure heart? Pure heart is one that is undivided in its devotion to God. Undivided. Do you know what that means? You stand for God. Nothing else. Again, I'm going to say this. I've said it many times. When you come to Jesus, you no longer have an opinion on anything. You died, Galatians 2.20, go and read it. You died and you no longer live anymore. So that means your opinions got nailed to the cross. That means your opinions got put into the ground. Well, I don't think, nope, doesn't matter what you think, it matters what God thinks, period. The Bible gives us what God thinks. So, so every time a Christian tries to move by their opinions, they don't have a pure heart. And they know what they lose? The reward. What is the reward? They don't get to see God. They lose the reward. But a pure heart is undivided in its devotion to God. That means God is you and no one else. If I am going to stand here and all of my friends and all of my family leave me, I'm going to stand here because my devotion is to you. I am not dividing my loyalty. I am not, I don't care what it costs me. Maybe it'll cost me my job. I don't care. I will stand for you, God. Maybe it'll cost me uh, my house. I don't care. I will stand for you, God. Maybe it'll cost me my reputation. I don't care. I will stand for you and you alone. I'm undivided in my loyalty. It is you. It is for you that I live and breathe and have my being. It is you. That's, that's what undivided loyalty and devotion looks like. It is something, it's a heart that's free of hidden motives. Do you know how many Christians have, have, have hidden motives? They serve God to get something from God. God will give you the desires of your heart if your heart's pure before him. But if you serve him to get something, you may get a reward in this life. But you want to know what you're losing? Purity of heart. Because you have a hidden motive. How about a, a life, a pure heart, is one that is fully aligned with God's will. What is God's will for humanity? That all would be saved. That's what his, that's what his will is. And again, I go back to the statement, what are you known for? Are you known to be an uncompromising, unapologetic preacher of righteousness who will stand against the moral decay of this day? Or are you known as someone who just goes with the flow? Silence is an action. We learned that Friday night. Not saying something is an action. It's an inaction, and, and it's, it's a sin. We're going to get there. Purity, what is purity? Defined in the Greek. Katharos is the Greek word. It means to be blameless, to be clean, unstained from guilt. In the moment of your conversion, that's you. But you know you have to maintain your relationship with God or it'll become like that disgusting pool of water. You know, I, I, was, I was looking at that picture and, and everything in there is external. It comes from our life. But you look at the pollution, somebody threw something in there. Everything we try to add to the gospel pollutes it. God don't need our help. He just needs us to be faithful. God don't need us to, he, he don't need us to do anything other than be a mouthpiece for him. Be an example for him. Let your light shine before others. This is what we're called to do. So we talk about biblical purity. It goes beyond avoiding sin. It's about actively pursuing God's righteousness. Are you actively pursuing the righteousness of God in your everyday life? Are you actively? I mean, every day you wake up, God, I want what you want. I want what you want. If you so tell me to stop working today, and, and maybe I, I only got two vacation days left, but if you tell me to, to not go in today and, and to go to the street corner and preach, you know what? I'm going to do that because I want what you want. Man, I won't have any days left for hunting season. How many Christians would think? I would think that. I'm just being honest. First thing I would, God, I don't know. I might have to go hunting this, this year. No, it doesn't matter because it's his will. I'm undivided in my loyalty. No matter what it costs me, I will, I will serve you. Every aspect of my life. What is the word heart? When we, we see purity, we know that it's unstained. It's deep, deeply rooted, rooted in the heart, requiring an internal transformation. So you say, what, what's the word heart defined in Greek? Caridia. This can refer to our physical heart. In the Bible, it can. But Jesus is not saying be pure in your physical heart, not your blood pumping organ. He's not saying be pure because, because I'm telling you what, if that's the case, I'm in trouble. I ate a lot of fried food. I ate a lot of junk food. 
And, and I'm probably guilty of not having the right things going in. But, but understanding what Jesus is saying, he's not talking about your physical heart. He's talking about your spiritual center. He's talking about your spiritual center. And again, most people think, my heart, yeah, I'm going to keep my heart. And they go like this, but it's not where he's talking about. You know, when, when the Bible is talking about your heart, he's talking about where you connect with God. He's talking about where you store the word of God up at. He's talking about where you make righteous decisions. Do you know where that is? Right there, your head. That's where it is. He's talking about, he says, so when he's saying being pure in heart, he's talking about being pure in your mind. That's what he's talking about. When the Bible refers to the heart, it encompasses entirely of a person's intellect, emotions, and will. The heart is a center of our intellect. Scripture tells us that this is a place that we pray with, that we know God, and that we meditate. It's in your mind. It's a place where you store up God's word. It's a place where we formulate plans in this earth. We're, we're going we're gonna to go to town later and have something to eat later. I'm making plans. It's in my heart. It's in my head. It's where I hold on to his truth. You know what Psalms 119.11 says? It says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That I might not have any sins in my life. People say, how do I live a sinless life? Store up the word of God in your mind. Read the Bible, not for head knowledge. Let it drop down in. Let it Read it for a spiritual understanding. God, what is sin? Look at the word of God. Store it up so that you won't sin. It's in our hearts that we think, question, reflect, believe, and yes, even sing. You can sing in your heart. Anybody, I mean, maybe you don't know anyone has a melody in their heart all the time. I'm that person. I will just break out in song at any time. No guarantees where I'm at, no and my kids know. I'd be in the shower and start singing. I'll be whistling a tune. I'll be out, and I'll just, all of a sudden, I'll break out and have one line come out. And I got a tune. I got a melody in my heart. Anybody know anybody like that? Anybody like that? All right, I'm glad I'm not the only weird person. Some people, it's in your heart. That's what you store up. And again, you go back to, to, to those things. And the girls and I, they were just laughing about this the other day. Because I'm, I'm now starting to transition into when they play the classic songs of my day. Like, like, no offense to anyone older than me. I'm not trying to pick on you. But now they're starting to put my generation songs up as commercials. <laughs> so, so we're sitting there like, Dad, did you know that song? Yeah, that was your age when that came out. Oh, wow, that's old. <laughs> but isn't it interesting, though? How quickly when you hear those songs, boom, you go right back to where you were. I mean, right now, I can remember where some songs, and, and there's one, I'm not going to tell you, well, Savage Garden, I'm going to be really, really romantic now, Madly Deeply. Anybody know that song? You older folks might not, but that was the first song that Bridget and I danced to, and I remember that. I remember that, so I'm a little sappy sometimes, but when that song comes on, Man, I am right there on the high school dance floor with my then, not wife, but my pretty girlfriend. And we're dancing. And I can remember the first time she laid her head on my shoulder. Right? Music matters. I'm telling you what. But then there's also songs that come on that have other memories that aren't so good. Where's that stored at? In your heart. In your hearts. What else is the heart? It's the center of emotions. Scripture describes a variety of hearts, a glad heart, a loving heart, a fearful heart, a courageous heart, a repentant heart, an anxious heart, an angry heart, a revived heart, an anguished heart, delighted, grieving, humble, excited, burning, troubled. Scripture talks about this. It's talking about emotional experiences. It's in your heart. That's where those emotions are. Do you know where offense is? In your heart. When somebody does something that you don't like and you get mad and then it's in your heart that you pick up an offense. Why do you think the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else? For it determines the course of your life. Do you know it's, it's easy to walk away from an offense? It's very easy. All you do is say, nope, you're not doing that to me, devil, and you walk away. But you know, 99% of all people will sit there and kick that thing around a little bit and then pick it up and look at it and, and they'll hold on to it for a little while. Do you know how you know you have an offense? You've picked up an offense? When you sit down and you think about the problem, when you start defending yourself in your head against somebody, somebody's wronged you and you think, next time I see them, you know what I'm going to tell them? Guess what? You picked up an offense. Guess what you have in your heart? A dead cow. 
Come on, let's be real. It's in your heart. It's in your emotions. What else? It's the, it's the center of our human will. It's where our motivation and purpose and determination are. I'm going to get up and go to church today. It's a decision that you made yesterday. I made the decision a long time ago that on Sunday, it's God's day. I'm not going to do anything else. I will be in church. I do go on vacation. I do miss a Sunday occasionally. But I'm telling you, it's a pre-decision. It's a motivation. I want to serve God. I want to love God. So before Sunday ever comes, I'm going to be in church. You want to know what else is a pre-decision? Living righteously. That's a pre-decision. I'm going to live righteous. Even if the world doesn't righteous, I'm going to be righteous. Even if the world says this is what's good and I know that it's what's evil, I'm going to stand against the evil because I know what God's word says. I'm pre-deciding I will serve God. As Joshua said, me and my house will serve God. That's, that's a pre-decision. Motivation and purpose and determination. It's our ability to make choices. You know what the Bible teaches? A hardened heart will resist God. That's what the Bible teaches. If your heart is hard, it resists God. It resists change. It resists transformation. But a heart that is yielded and submitted and devoted, it pursues a deeper relationship. And so being pure in heart means having the same attitudes of God. Having the same mind of God. You know what that looks like in today's culture? I love what God loves and I hate what God hates. That's what that looks like. Doesn't matter what culture says. Doesn't matter what the world's preaching and promoting. I will stand for God on every area of my life. It's a heart that's undivided with no hypocrisy and no hidden motives. Romans chapter 12 verse 9 emphasizes the importance of inner purity and sincere devotion to God. And I, I, I love this in the New Living Translation. I really love this verse. This really cuts to the heart of things. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Really love them. Uh, I, I was talking with somebody earlier this week about what true conversion looks like in Christ versus, and, and there might be a sermon that comes out of this at some point, ver, versus a false conversion. True conversion. People who are truly converted to Christ don't pretend to love others. They actually love them. They actually love them. And then look at what it says. You this person, this describes a pure heart. It says, hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. Hold tightly. And I can probably describe this in a hundred different ways, but all my kids like to hug me, but my youngest, when she hugs me, she likes to squeeze the peanut butter out of me. And she'll come up and she'll grab a hold of me and she will try her hardest. And you know, I'll sit there and I'll wince like it actually hurts. It don't hurt. It really don't hurt. But, but she thinks like, and I'll say, oh, you got to watch. But, but that's what it's talking about. When you're talking in the context of what is good, he, God, God is saying through his word right here, we need to hold tightly, that tightly around what is good, what is righteous, what is pure, what is holy. We need to hold tightly to it. What does that look like? That means you don't waver no matter who it is walking in sin. You don't waver. You give them the word of God in love. You preach the word in love. But you don't waver. You don't condone behaviors. You don't, you don't turn a blind eye or keep your mouth shut to keep the peace. We're going to talk about peacemakers next week. You know what the Bible doesn't say? Blessed are the peacekeepers. No, 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 no. Peacekeepers keep their mouth shut and don't say anything. Peacemakers make peace. There's a difference. Making peace is not just silently going along with something. It's at all costs there will be peace and I will be the institute of that peace. But our culture right now is all about tolerance. They don't even have a category for discernment of good and evil. I mean, it's, it's so weird out there right now. It is so peculiar right now. Our culture is preaching evil to be good. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not any, it shouldn't surprise us because they're lost people. The lost people act lost. That should never surprise us. But really what we need to understand is this is not a my, me and my neighbor battle. It's not a political war. It is not a war between somebody on the other side of the aisle. This is a spiritual war that we're fighting. There are two kingdoms right now at war. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. There's team Satan and there's team Jesus. And you have to decide which one you're going to be on. You are making that decision. By holding tightly to what is good, you're making a decision to be on team Jesus. Just in case you don't know, I read the whole book, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. So you need to make a decision wisely. 
You need to make a decision. This war, it's, it's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual war. You can't stand for God and his word and pray the world gets saved if you continue to empower those who pass wicked laws. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the truth. That's the truth. People don't like it when I talk like this. People often say, well, isn't Jesus about love? Yes, Jesus is about love. But when you see when Jesus preaches love, the first thing he says after that is repent and sin no more. He doesn't say you can stay in your sin. He doesn't say I'm going to tolerate your sin. He says, no, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So, so we have a, a moral compass in this world that's off. I mean, we got all kinds of weird things, wicked things, uh, disgusting things going on in our world. And the pure in heart have to hate what is evil. Do we love the sinner? Absolutely. We love them enough to tell them that hell's waiting for them unless they turn from their wicked ways. That's what we tell them. That's how much we love them. Those who have a pure heart have their minds in tune with the heart of God. And it shows up in everything that they do. I mean everything that you do. It shows up. The pure in heart. The Beatitudes. They're calling for a total transformation. They're calling for it. A pure heart opposes the things that God hates. It resists evil and it stands firm in faith even when the culture blurs the lines between good and evil. Here's an interesting statement. When we come to God, we cannot only lift up to God our clean hands. You know, you've got to lift up a pure heart too. And again, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Psalms 24, but what are you known for? Are you known for a preacher of righteousness? Is that what's, I mean, I mean, in Noah's day, in Noah's day, he was the only man righteous that was found. He was a preacher of righteousness. That's what he was known for. But, but are you known for being a preacher of righteousness or not? So when you come to God, it's not just clean hands, but it's also a pure heart. It's a pure conscience. Are you a preacher of righteousness? Look at Psalms 24. It says, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Next verse. Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. Again, heart. Who do not worship idols and never tell lies. The heart must be pure. A pure heart loves what God loves and hates what God hates. What does God hate? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. You say, what's haughty eyes? When you look down your nose at somebody and you say, huh, look how terrible they are. You want to know one of the biggest reasons people aren't coming to Jesus? Because too many Christians have haughty eyes. Amen. Too many Christians are looking down their nose at people instead of opening the door and saying, you know what? What you're doing is wrong, but I want to show you a better way. You make room for people when they come in. Give them a chance. Give them a chance to know who Jesus is. Let the Holy Spirit work on them. But the problem is people, they judge Christians based upon the past sins of Christians. And they won't come into a church because they've been met at the door and told, you've got to wear better clothes. They were met at the door and saying, you're not welcome in here. They were met at the door saying, hey, you're a drunkard, you're a homosexual. Listen, those people need to hear the gospel. Those people need to have a way to come to that altar. And sometimes they might need to come once, twice, three times or more to, before the Holy Spirit can crack into that heart and get into them. And we as Christians, we are to disciple those people. But, but again, what are you known for? Are you, are you one who, who only says hateful things? Or are you one that will go into the ditch where the people are really lost and pick them up and pull them out of the ditch? And what are you known for? But what does God hate? Haughty eyes. He hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. And I could probably spend the next hour and a half talking about abortion. I don't agree with it. I'm not going to do that today. But I'm telling you what, it is a problem. It is a problem. Christians cannot support people who support abortion. I'm sorry. You can't. It's the most purest form of life. Actually, at conception, there's a light, boom, it explodes inside the womb. When that light explodes, boom, God spoke, light happened, right? So, so right there in the belly of a, of a mama is a brand new life at conception. We've got to protect that life. And everything that we do, hold, to what, hold tight to what is good. Hate the things that are evil. What else? Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. These are things that God hates. A false witness who breathes out lies. And this last one, one who sows discord among brothers. I'm telling you, there's an enemy out there that hates Jesus. He hates you. He hates the church. He hates Christians. And he is trying to use every Christian to sow discord. That's what he's trying to do. 
But what are we to do? Overlook an offense, love people. What should our heart cry be? God, keep me from the things that you hate. Keep me from those things, God. I want to hate the things that you hate. I want to love what you love. I'm not going to rationalize sin. I'm not going to rationalize wicked things. Maybe you don't know this, but I'm going to encourage you. Go read Romans chapter 1. There's a whole list from 18 to 32 highlighting God's wrath upon humanity. Go and read it. I really encourage you. Because of what? Their wickedness. Paul says God's wrath is, is upon humanity because they, in their thinking they exchanged the glory of God for a lie. They worshiped the things rather than the creator. And then he says they gave themselves the shameful lust, unnatural sexual relations. Women and women, men and men, adults and children. I mean, the pedophilia, it's, it's there. They're unrighteous. This is because uh, they, they've given themselves to this. People are filled with this evil. But here's the last verse what I want to draw your attention to. Verse 32 Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. That's not me saying that. The Bible says that. But look at what I have highlighted and underlined. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. They give approval of those who practice them. Christ followers are called to resist, but not only resist, but we're also warned against endorsing and supporting immoral behavior. The judgment This is what this is saying. The judgment that is upon the people walking in sin is upon those who approve of that. And silence, again, let me tell you, is an action. You know why we live in a country the way that we live in? Because men and women of God have not stood up and said, I will stand with God no matter what it costs me. That's why we live in a country the way that we live in. Because for, for decades, people, Christians, have become passive and they've bought this lie that, that, that everything's the way that God wants it to be. It's all going according to his plan. God's sovereign. It's all. No, it is not. The way things are because they are because people have been inactive. Men and women of God should have been standing up decades ago saying, I'm not going to permit you to take prayer out of my school. I'm not going to permit you to take the Bible out of my school. The church started the school and the church will stay in the school. See, most people don't realize that the state didn't start the school. The church did. And then the state put their fingers in it and ruined it all and kicked the church out. Same thing with our prison system. Prison system was started by the church. A lot of people don't know that either. Then the state got involved, and it's it's the shape that it's in today. See, when you take God out of something, when you turn your back to God, evil comes right in. And you've got to be the person who will stand there, even if you stand alone and say, I will not give my approval to the things that God hates. No matter what it costs me. No matter what it costs me. It troubles me that some Christians think their approval or their silence is, is, is something that is virtuous. It isn't. In society, sin is often celebrated. Many Christians succumb to social pressure. And rather than calling it out and calling for repent, repentance, they just become silent. You know, churches are doing this now too. And I'll be the first person to tell you it'll never happen here. If it does, you have my permission to throw me out. But I'm telling you what, if, if, you, if you go to a church that condones sinful behavior, flies a rainbow flag, and does all that, they're an institution of Satan. And all they're doing is opening up the, the pits of hell, bringing them in the front door, and throwing them right into hell. Because God does not tolerate sin. Now, can God change? Yes, he can change their heart. And we don't exclude those people. We make room for them to come to know Jesus. We become, we become preachers of righteousness, loving people. But I'm telling you right now, if a church stands for sinful behavior, they are not an institution of God. They are not, and they never will be. Our culture is drifting further and further away from God. It is necessary for us to have clean, pure hearts, to stand firm in the faith. Be willing to be a peculiar person. For someone to look at you and say, man, you're strange. You're a little bit weird. You know, we are being called weird. A traditional family is being called weird right now. Christian beliefs are being called weird right now. Because you believe in a being in the sky. He's my father. He's not a being in the sky. You know, your position, every time, uh, uh, I don't know who I was talking to, but somebody I was talking to, it was in a public setting, and someone took the Lord's name in vain, and they said, no, no, you're not going to do that around me. We should be offended at that stuff. Not an offense that causes us to hate the person, but willing to stand up and say, you know what? Have some respect. That's my God you're talking about. 
That's my Lord that you're taking his name in vain. And if you don't like it, then you can go over there. But he's my Lord. I'm not going to tolerate it. You say, but how many families tolerate that? Because that one family member, you know, they just might not come back. Sorry. Sorry. You don't push them out. You don't hate them. You don't beat them up. But you tell them, look, this is my house. I'm not going to tolerate it. This is my house. My house, we don't permit swearing. My house, I don't permit any kind of alcohol in my house. I don't permit smoking outside. You say, that's crazy and extreme. No, if you want to smoke, get in your car, go down, go down the street. But this is my house. I have dedicated to God. I have dedicated to God. Am I saying that those people are terrible people? No, but this is my house. And so my house, I stand on what my convictions are. And so I don't tolerate things in my house. And people get upset at me about that. Okay. That's okay. You can be upset with me about that. I still love you. You're still family. That's great. But, but my house, my rules. Sorry. But oftentimes people will say, man, you sound like a, a person spitting hate. That's not how Jesus is. I think we forget that Jesus formed a whip and drove out money changers. I think we forget that Jesus was a little bit radical. He liked to stir the pot with the religious people. He liked to go in and, 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 and really mess things up. We don't need to endorse sin. A pure heart is one that is single-minded in its devotion, free from hypocrisy. Free from hypocrisy. And it's aligned to his will. Next key aspect we're going to talk about is the challenge of a pure heart. The challenge. There is a real challenge of a pure heart. I'm telling you, this is what I'm trying to say. We get a pure heart when you come to Jesus, but the moment you take a step towards God, the devil comes in. He's trying to push you off that path. He's trying to bring contaminants into your life. He is trying to get you to pollute your purity. Your purity your, your, he's trying to get you to pollute your mind immediately. Why? Because he fears someone who has a pure heart. Why? Because they know who God is. The reward of a pure heart is you get to know God. You get to see God. But listen, the challenge of maintaining a pure heart, it is complex, involving internal struggles. It involves external pressures. And there's this, there's this understanding that these things are in opposition to you. Whether you realize it or not, we have internal struggles. And if you tell me you don't, we need to talk because I need to take some notes from you. I'm telling you what, there are some self-righteous people that will convince you that they don't have any problems in life. There are some self-righteous people that will say, you know what, I don't sin. You know, I don't try to, but you know, I do make mistakes. I do, just as I said yesterday. I made a mistake, and I wasn't too big to go and say, I'm sorry. I messed up. But, but there's these internal struggles. We have this great war within us. This great internal struggle. Even if you're a Christian, you have this. Each and every day, you have this. What is one thing that the world preaches right now? Follow your heart, right? You know what Jeremiah said about your heart? We're going to see. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You realize that is the worst, most toxic, terrible advice you could ever give somebody. And you know how many Christians say it? Just follow your heart. That's a terrible idea. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Why? We're in the shape we're in because somebody followed their heart in our country. That's why. Somebody said, well, you know what? My heart really breaks. My heart breaks too. I don't want them to go to hell. I don't break so they can condone it. But your heart is your mind. Remember that. It's your intellect, your emotions, your desires. And if it remains untouched by the word of God, it's bent on destruction and deception. It's bent on it. You have nothing you can do about it. If you don't put this word of God in your heart, in your mind, if you don't study it, then you are bent on deception and destruction in everything that you do. Can you follow your heart if you put the word of God in? Yeah. Because you're building in the, the statutes of God. How many times have you ever been, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many times have you ever been confronted with the temptation to do something that was wrong and immediately the Bible comes alive in your heart and your mind. You go, ooh, no, 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 that's sin. I'm going to walk away from that. Why is that? Because you took time to sow the word of God into your heart. But those who don't, they follow their heart. What does their heart say? Oh, that's an immediate pleasure. I'm just going to go do it. Feels good, looks good, smells good, tastes good. But you see, your heart, 
It's the most deceitful. So if you're not putting the word of God in, it's terrible advice. Apart from God and his word, you'll always follow the natural carnal disaster that your heart is leading you to. You've got to be like David. Look at Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. See, there's a challenge against your heart. The enemy is trying to pollute your heart. And you need to have the understanding that it's possible. It's possible. He'll lead you through the temptations, and he will lead you to pollute your heart. But you need to have an eye on your heart. You need to guard your heart, like Proverbs said, and and speak, God, create in me a clean heart. God, renew in me a right spirit. Much like a drainage system, your heart can become clogged over time. We experienced that this week with all this rain. I came in here and there was four inches of water at the back of the building trying to come in the back door. And I went, where's our drains? They're all full. So why are the drains full? Because out on the street, the drains are full and all the road water ran into behind the church. And I spent like two hours digging drains out to open it up and alleviate the pressure. As soon as I got the clog out, it was amazing. All that water in the parking lot went away. It was amazing. You know, your heart can become clogged. Your heart, your mind, it can become clogged with sin. It can become clogged with all this clutter. What does sin do? It desensitizes us to God. It dulls your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. But you know how you fix that? Times of refreshing come from the presence of God. God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit with me. Get in the presence of God. Get in the word of God. And it clears the clutter out. Maintaining purity addresses internal struggles such as negative thoughts and hidden motives and emotional wounds. It addresses them. It doesn't overlook them. A lot of times people don't like to confess that they have a problem that they're struggling with. And as long as you're not willing to deal with it, you're going to fight it. But you know, the Bible says confession is good for the soul. What I tell people often is if you're really having trouble with certain areas of your life, find an accountability partner. Find a man or a woman of God that you trust that you know won't gossip and go to them and say, help keep me accountable. I'm confessing to you because now that you've exposed it, the enemy can't use it to hurt you because now you have a mind that, okay, I need a clean, pure heart. But there's this real struggle. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life, not your heart, the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You know, your, sin, your, your nature, you're just natural person, craves to do the things that are not of God. It does. You're going to want to get up, and, and trust me, you're going to want to be mean when somebody's mean to you. You're going to want to withhold forgiveness. You're going to want to hate somebody because they have different views than you. But the Holy Spirit will say, no, you need to love them. The Holy Spirit will say, you need to forgive them. The Holy Spirit will say, it'll teach you who Jesus is. But look at what Paul writes in Galatians. He says, if you let the Holy Spirit guide you, you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And then in verse 17, he says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the, spirit, or the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you're not free to carry out your own good intentions. You see, we have good intentions. Most Christians have good intentions. But I've, I've heard this said many times, the highway to hell is paved with good intentions. We just never act on them. We just never act on them. We're complacent. We're lazy. Uh, we, we use grace as an eraser. We use grace as an excuse. We love the grace. It's interesting, most Christians love grace, but they hate to give it. There's a little zinger. I don't know where that came from, Jake. (laughs) That was free. That's what Jake said. That's free. Most Christians love grace, but they hate to give grace. Most Christians love mercy, but they hate to give mercy. Aside from the internal pressures, we have external pressures that challenge us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, coming back to the word of God. This is where you become pure. This is where you purify your heart. The word of God. Do not be conformed. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing. You see that? You know what that means? You're going to have a test. How many of you love pop quizzes in school? How many of you just sit there and, ah, it's Monday. Give me that algebra pop quiz. I never took algebra, so. I hated tests. I hated quizzes. They're open book. I'm good. I don't have to study for open book tests. 
It's really funny. I, I shouldn't, maybe I should say that oh, confession's good for the soul. I didn't take many reports. I didn't do any of that stuff. I usually got someone else to do them for me in school. <laughs> usually paid somebody else or, or had somebody else. And, and Bridget was not that person. So she's, she is the best thing about my, my teenage years. She would never have done that for me. But I had some other people that would. You know, there's a test coming for the purity of your heart. There's a test coming. And it may even be today. Before you even get home, maybe someone's going to cut you off and you're going to see how pure you really are. Maybe you're going to go into the restaurant and, and somebody's going to give you half of what you ordered. Or maybe your food will take twice as long. There's a test coming to see how pure that you really are. Do not be conformed to this world. What would, what would society expect? I mean, do you ever get some, again, I, I failed this test so many times. I made reservations. I go to the place. They forget my reservations, and I end up staying there an hour and 40 minutes. They forgot about me, and then it took us still another hour and 40 minutes to get our food. Like, that's a test. That's a real test. You think, man, well, the struggle's real. There are real Christians struggling even deeper tests. What do you do when somebody puts a gun in your face and says, renounce your Savior? If you can't pass the test at the restaurant, you ain't going to pass the test when somebody challenges your faith. Do not be conformed. The world would say, defend yourself. The world would say, I'm going to get you before you get me. But Jesus says, love thy neighbor. Even if it means dying, I will preach this gospel to you. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're going to be tested. The purity of your heart is going to be tested. The real pressure, and what Paul is saying here, is the real pressure is going to be to copy the, co the customs and the behaviors of this day. That's what the pressure is. You're going to be pushed to conform. You're going to be pushed to just go with the flow. Secular values. This is the pattern to conform to secular values. A push to adopt and align with the world standards that go against God's teachings. They're going to test you, push you to conform to shallow and immediate gratification. I've said this so many times, confession's good for the soul. One-click buying is a terrible thing. I hate it. I hate it. I've, I've, I've spent lots of money with one-click buying on Amazon because I'm impulsive at times. And I look at something, I go, oh, I need that. And then afterwards, I have buyer's remorse. I know I really didn't need that. The world pushes in. That's why it works so well, because your heart is bent towards that. And that's not just in those things, but how about where, where there's decisions made that honor other areas of your flesh. I mean, you could go right down the line with, with any of them. Sexual, I mean, immediate gratification, instant. All I got to do is do this, and I have a sexual pleasure. Boom, I can do this, and I can fill my belly and be living gluttonous. Boom, I can do that. And there's just go right down the line. The world's trying to conform you to that. Moral and ethical decay. A push to embrace and normalize behaviors and attitudes that are contrary to what God says. There's a great push for that, to be conformed to the world. But God's people who are pure in heart, they will stand against it. They will not be conformed. They'll be peculiar people. They will be a peculiar people. Paul calls us to resist. I love this, this verse out of Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. I just found this. I've read this many times, but when I was studying for this, it just like stood off the page at me. You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you're called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd and twist justice. That's interesting. How many times do we just have herd mentality? We just go with the flow. You know, there, there's been all these studies that's made. Uh, they'll, they'll take traffic cones and put them on sidewalks. And they'll put one person there at the beginning of the head. And then they'll, they'll deviate and go out around into the street. And then it's so funny. Everybody will get out off the sidewalk, go onto the street. Why? There's no reason for it. Just the first person did it and everyone else did it. It's herd mentality. Do you know how many people go into sin with herd mentality? Just because every, it's so much easier to go to the family reunion. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Somebody went, mm. It's so much easier to go to the family reunion and say nothing because you don't want to upset nobody. But you know what true love does? You're going to hell. That's what true love does. That's what true love is. It's not afraid to stand. And they may tell you to be quiet. That's fine. But they're going to know before I get there what I stand for. It's not going to be something I'm dealing with right then and there at the family reunion. It's going to be before I get there. They're going to know who I am. See, that's why when I go back to this idea of what are you known for? I want to be known before I ever come into the group that I don't stand for anything like that. I stand only for God. 
But don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. We should be different. We should guard against this challenge of impurity. This shows up in the world around us. It shows up in our relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. I, I bring that verse up a lot because, again, herd mentality, just going with the flow. If you have bad company, it's going to ruin any good morals that you have in you. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Does that mean you stay away from No, you've got to be in the world to preach to the lost. You can't, you can't preach to the lost from church. <laughs> Sorry. That's why I don't really understand revivals in a church. You know, we spend all this time reviving the saints, getting the saints born again again and again and again and again. Why not have a revival where the lost people are? That's what I don't understand. Have a revival where, they, but that's what it looks like. You go out and you, and, you, and you preach, but you don't live where there's bad company. You don't live there. We must guard against being corrupted. Here's, I'm going I'm to move a little quicker now. We must guard against being corrupted because this shows up in spiritual warfare. You realize that the enemy is trying to pollute your heart through spiritual means. I'm telling you, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. What is he doing? He's seeking for someone to devour. He's not looking, he, <laughs> he's not just going around to be pet. He's not a kitty cat. He's a roaring, vicious lion, and he's looking. He's looking. You think the devil don't study you? You think, Christians, that the devil don't look at your lifestyle, don't look at the things that you scan on Facebook or on your internet or your phone? You don't look at the things you watch on TV, don't pay attention to things you listen to? You think the devil don't? He does, because that's how he knows how, how easy it is to trip people up. You give him all the tools. You say, here, here, this is everything that I have a weakness with. I'm telling you how to, how to trap me. I'm telling you how to do this. See, we give him the tools and then he does. But he's a roaring lion. He's looking for someone to devour. This verse vividly describes Satan as a predatory force. He's seeking to undermine your purity. His aim is to corrupt your heart. Spiritual warfare. Did you know that spiritual warfare shows up with impurity? Sexual impurity. You go right down the line. Uh, temptation. For instance, pornography is a billion-dollar industry. Do you know why it's a billion-dollar industry? Because a lot of people give that financial support. That's why. You think it's not something that the devil's using? Addiction. It's a spiritual stronghold. Addictions. Have you ever met anybody who's under an addiction? Addictions are real, and they're spirits that drive these things. This is an attack against purity. These are strongholds. Mental, emotional struggles. Do you know why that you go through anxiety and depression? Because those are oppressions that the enemy is using, demonic oppressions, to keep your heart from being pure. These are spiritual warfare tactics. Violence and aggression. Busyness. Here, here's one that a lot of people don't get. Busyness and distraction. It is, so, it is often under overlooked, and it, nobody picks up on it. But the devil will get you out of purity by just keeping you busy. Just keeping you busy. You're not even paying attention. You've just got so much stuff going. And trust me, I know what it means to be busy. There's days that I sit down and I go, I didn't get nothing done today. I had a whole bunch of little things that I did, but I feel like nothing got accomplished. I was so busy and I missed out on some of the important things that I needed to do. It's a spiritual attack against Christians to keep them from being pure. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There is a real spiritual battle that's going on, and it is aimed at your heart. It's aimed at your heart. But we need to understand, we've got a challenge. And, and when there's a challenge, we resist. We're resisting these things. And again, you have to put yourself in a position where you're like David. You say, God created me a clean heart. Renewing me a right spirit. I understand that there's challenges in this day that's going to drag me and try to pull me into impurity, but I want to be righteous before you. I want to be pure. I want to be known for a, a man or a woman of God. And if you can do that, you get to the reward. Guys, if you want to come back, Jeff, I'm going to wrap up. Praise God. What is the reward of a pure heart? Well, it's nothing less than the ability to see God. It's what it is. You get to see God. It's not just talking about a future in heaven. Although it includes that, the reward is you can experience God today. You can experience the presence of God right now. You can experience it tonight, tomorrow, 
tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. You can have the presence of God. But what this is talking about is you have the ability to have a deeper, more intimate relationship with God in the here and now. And really, Jesus is giving these things and he's saying blessed. What is, remember, do you guys remember what blessed means? It means you're happy. It means you're happy. What would be the most greatest form of happiness for a Christian? To know God. I mean, isn't that what we're here for? Isn't that why we, we gave our hearts to God? Isn't that what we're late? We're anticipating heaven right now. Why? So that we can go be with God. But most Christians who are crying for God to be in heaven, they don't realize they can have the presence of God right now today. That's the reward. Blessed are the pure in heart because they get to see God. They get to have a relationship with God. You don't have to wait till heaven to get it. That is what's so amazing about this. If you resist the challenges of this day and understand that you're going to fall, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have problems, understanding that from the beginning. But you were pure the minute that Jesus washed your heart. The minute that he, that he completely re rewired your thinking. You were pure. It's your job to keep yourself pure. It's not a legalistic approach. It's not about legalism, but it's about a desire. It's not I have to be pure. I want to be pure. I want to be pure. See, we get to see God as ours, and we get to enjoy him. Do you ever think about that? That's what the reward is. They get to see God. If you're not pure, you don't get to see God. But you get to have him, and you get to enjoy him. How many of you would love 10 minutes on the lap of God, the Father? How many of you today want to be on the lap of I mean, you can have that. You don't have to wait. James chapter 4, verse 8, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Listen to this. Wash your hands. Clean your hands. Purify your hearts. Get the contaminants out. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. But if you come close to God, he comes close to you. Psalm 17, 15, because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. That's what we're talking about. When your hearts are pure, you can perceive God's presence and you can perceive his work in your life. Do you know there was a man in the Bible that asked God to see him face to face? Anybody know who that man was? Moses. Moses. I, I love reading that passage. There's a song out. I can't remember the, who, who actually originally sang it, but, but there's a couple different artists that sing it out. Show me your face, God. One of my absolute favorite songs absolute favorite songs talking about a deep intimacy Moses asked God he says show me your face show me your glory I'm not satisfied with the miracles that I saw I, that, I've seen those miracles that was great that's not enough I want more of you God I want more of you yeah I seen you split the Red Sea and you completely swallowed up all of our enemies I want more yet I see I see what you're doing yeah I see I want more how many of you would be known for a person who asked to see the face of God. I want to see your face. I want to see your face. It's interesting how this all come about in Moses' life. God told Moses to take the people of Israel and go into the promised land. And you know what he said? He goes, as an insurance policy, I'll send an angel with you. And this is what I love about the heart of Moses. This is why I've studied Moses so much. Moses said, uh-uh. If you're not going with me, I'm not going. If you don't go with me, God, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay right here. If you don't go with me, I won't take another step. You know, I think that was a test. I think it was a test Moses was taking. I think God was, was testing him because are you really, truly willing to give up everything just to have God? I mean, the pure in heart, they get to see God. But he says, I'm not going to go another step. Verse, in Exodus 33, 16, it says, For how it should be known that I found favor in your sight. How are they going to know if you're not going with me? So that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. God replied to Moses in verse 17, he says, The Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. I know you by name. And then Moses says, Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. What's interesting about this is what God says. He says, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Why did Jesus say we can see God if we're pure in heart? Because we can. You understand, this is fulfilled in Christ. 
This whole thing is fulfilled in Jesus. And I'm telling you, there is a place that you can get to in this earth on this, on this very day that all of your troubles go away, I promise you. It's in that place of glory. You see, in Moses' day, God took Moses and he hid him in the, 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 the crevice of the rock. And he covered him so that it, his presence, as it passed by, it wouldn't kill him. But you know, Jesus came and he died and he shed his blood. Why? So that you can come into the very near presence of God. You don't have to be hidden in, in a crevice any longer. You can walk in and be in the presence of God. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 9, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So this morning, we're going to wrap up. I want to take a moment to just reflect. You know, we talked about what purity is. We talked about what your heart is. We talked about the challenges that we're facing, and we've talked about the reward. And the question I'm asking you now is, where are you? And where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? And so this morning... Jeff's going to play a little bit. I'm going to open the altars. I'm just going to encourage you, everybody here. I just want you to, to bow your heads, bow your hearts. Please don't be looking around because this is intimate time. If you feel a tug in your heart, because I believe God's calling all of us to a deeper level of purity today. I truly believe that God is calling. You might think that you're in a good place, but I'm promising you there's a deeper place. There is a deeper place where the face of God is available to you. The Holy Spirit stirring within you. He's urging us to examine our hearts. Are there impurities in your heart? That's what I, my question is. Are there contaminants in your, in your streams that are poisoning everything in your body? I'm encouraging you to examine this. And if there is things that need to be removed, and come to an altar and remove it. And an altar is an altar of repentance. It's a place of worship. Uh, it's a place you may come to the altar and say, I have no contaminants in my heart. I just want more of God. You know, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. That's what I'm telling you. So I'm inviting you this morning. Maybe you've got hidden sin. Maybe there's divided loyalty. Maybe there's a worldly desire that's, that's clouding out your vision of God. In this next couple moments, if you need an altar, come here. If you're not comfortable, I'm not going to shame you. Make an altar at your seat. But I'm telling you, deal with the unresolved guilt. Deal with the, the, un, the un, unconfessed sin. Deal with unforgiveness. Deal with these impurities. Why? So that you can have a pure heart and you can see God. And so right now, we're going to go and Jeff's just going to minister to us. And I'm just going to give you a time of examination.
We're not just coming to a physical space. I just want to encourage you that. Remain in this, this mindset and attitude of examination. Remain in this place of, of worship right now. You're coming to the foot of the cross. The Bible says that you can boldly come to the throne room of grace to obtain mercy. And I'm telling you, no matter where you are, you're not where you should be. I promise you that. The Holy Spirit is here. And if he's tugging at your heart, I want to encourage you right now, right now. Go deeper. Be bold enough to be like Moses and say, God, show me your face. God, show me your face. God, I'm not satisfied. I'm not happy. I'm trying. I'm, I'm working. But I want to see your face. I've seen you move in my life, but that's not enough. I want to know you at a more deeper level. God, I want to see your face. You know, and that's what's so awesome about this. Because of the blood of Jesus, you can come before God. The veil was torn to the holy of holies. The place was opened up. God is saying, I am here. If you want more of me, I'm here. you got to draw near me. So whether you're here to repent, whether you want to renew your commitment, whether you want to go deeper, I'm encouraging you. Be bold. Ask the question. Ask the question. Am I satisfied with where I am? Am I satisfied? Last call. If you need to make time, make peace with God. Let's do it right now. If you need to clear contaminants out, let's do it right now. Don't leave today. This is the moment that the Holy Spirit showed me. God told me today that there would be people who would be set free from unforgiveness today. He said there's going to be people who's going to remove contaminants that have been in your heart for years and years. And he's here. He's ready. If you want to give them, you can walk out of this place today with freedom. You can walk out of this place today with victory and walk in a place of peace that you've never been in before. Today is the day. Don't let that moment pass you by. Last call. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all Worship you. All I have, I give you praise. All I adore is in. this morning whether it's somebody online I don't know whether it's somebody in this room but the Holy Spirit just said there are people who want, need to recommit and there are people who need to commit they have an insurance policy Jesus it's only if it's real but it's not it's not a real conversion and God is saying today is your day today is the day of salvation don't let the day pass you if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life I'm going to help you with that today. It's very simple. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And you will be saved. 
So this morning, right now, if you've never made that commitment, or maybe you have the insurance policy Jesus, you have Geico Jesus, it's, it's just in case hell's real and you don't want to be there. You need to transition to, God, I want more of you. God, I want to have a real relationship with you, one that redefines every area of my life. That's true conversion. This morning, I'm going to encourage you. Say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I acknowledge before you today that my heart has been wicked. But Father, I know that Jesus is your son. He is the Lord. He is my Lord. And I confess today I will serve him. I thank you, Father, for saving me. The Bible says all who call upon the Lord shall be saved. So, Father, thank you for saving me today. Help me today to keep my heart pure. Help me today to be able to, to, to continually surrender my mind, my will, my emotions. And help me today, Father, as I encounter the challenges against the purity of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're in here this morning and you need a touch in body, I'd like to ask you to lift your hand. If you're sick in your body, we got one. Anybody else need touched in their body? Two up front, three right here, four, five. Keep your hands up, six. If, if somebody's hands up, I'm going to call on the body to do what ministry is supposed to look like in a church. Lay your hands on the person who's surrounding you. Anyone that's around people with their hands up, get your hands on them. Get your hands on them. You know, I can pray for you all day long, and I would do that all day long, but the Word of God in your mouth is as powerful as it is in my mouth. It's as powerful as it is in, in your mouth as it is in mine. I promise you. Lay hands. If you need touched in body, hold your hands up high, and people surround them. We're going to corporately pray right now. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that you have a healing covenant, Lord, with your children for those whose hearts are turned to you. The Bible says you're looking to and fro throughout the entire earth for those who are righteous. Why? To be mighty and strong on their behalf. So, Father, you established a covenant by the stripes of Jesus. We are healed. That's what the word says. Not maybe, not if, not someday. It is today. It's a present reality as much as it is a future reality. The Bible says in Psalms 107, it says he sent his word and it healed them. Jesus came so that we, our bodies, might be physically healed. So Lord, I speak to the mountains that are in their life. I say be removed right now. Pain, sickness, disease, infirmity, cancer, whatever you're dealing with. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, I tell you to go from these people. In the mighty name of Jesus, I speak to their body and with the authority of Jesus Christ, I say body be healed. Body be renewed. Be restored. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Father, for Bobby Hall, we lift him before you again. Restored in Jesus' name. For Tom Mortar, we lift him before you. We say restored in Jesus' name. For Troy Morningstar, be restored in Jesus' name. For the people that are here, for my dad, in the name of Jesus, be restored. I say in Jesus' name, you will no longer be, be uh, under the affliction that the enemy has brought to you, but from this day forward, body be made whole in the mighty matchless name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you, God, are quickly working on our behalf and bringing healing. You're bringing spiritual healing, emotional healing. You're bringing physical healing. You're bringing it to us, Father, through Jesus and through your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you and I praise you for what is happening right now. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And as you go from this place today, I want to encourage you. Every time the devil tries to remind you of that infirmity, say, no, I rebuke that thought. I am healed in Jesus' name. I am walking in a body that he recreated in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you, God, for your covenant that you have with your children. I thank you, God, that you're not a respecter of persons. I thank you, Father, what you did for one, you'll do for another. What you did in the Old Testament, what you did in the days of Jesus, you will do again. And you continue to do. You're the God of miracles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father God. You're the God of miracles. And we give you glory and we give you honor. Hallelujah. Father, today, as we depart from this place... God, I pray, Father, right now, that in a new way we would approach the throne room of God. 
I pray, Father, that with clean hands and a pure heart, that we would be desiring to see your face, that we wouldn't be satisfied with the deposit that we got. We want more. We want more, a more intimate and deeper relationship. And Father, I thank you that as we go, we will go with the presence of the living God and we will have whatsoever thing that we ask because we ask it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I pray that you have a wonderful day. And I want to remind you, please help us with some chairs. No midweek service this week. There are ball tickets available if you're interested in those. Other than that, have a blessed week and have a great day. God bless. Thanks again for joining us today. I pray that this message has touched you and helped you to grow. I want to take a moment right now and I want to encourage you. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to do so right now. Or maybe you're the person who says, I've made Jesus my Lord once, but I've fallen away from him. I've lost my first love. I want to encourage you, get right with God right now. We don't have much time left on this earth. Jesus is coming back and I'm going to make sure that you're ready when he does. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's very simple. I want you to say, Father, I am a sinner. I know that I'm destined for hell. The Bible says if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe it in your heart, you'll be saved. So say this, say, Jesus, I confess that you are my Lord and my Savior. And the days that I have left on this earth, I commit to serving you with all that I am. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for being the sacrifice for me. Amen. And if you've done that, you are saved. And if you meant that in your heart, you're saved. And I want to encourage you, reach out to us here at the church. Our number is 814-448-9545. Or you can find us on social media. You can find us on our website. I want to encourage you, reach out and let us know if you've made a commitment to Christ today. We want to be able to help disciple you and grow you in the kingdom of God. Again, I hope this helped you today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.